a medium water brush, which is the brush that we paint with, that I paint with in all the classes. And I recommend that everybody buy. And you can buy these at Michael's, you can buy these at Hobby Lobby. And if you're thinking, no, I wanna wait and see if I win this, I promise you, you will use more than one brush. You wear them out. We, you'll paint enough with me in a short period of time that you're wanting more than one, just one brush. And so go ahead and buy one of those brushes. Then you also get these, get a pencil, the Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga pencils, and you also receive a Sharpie ultra fine uh, marker, which is what we use at the end of, so it, that's a $125 value. Actually, it's a lot more than that value because you can't buy this paint this way any other way. You would be paying $8 for each, $8 to $12 for each one of these colors. And instead you get all of this for $125 or by submitting your art that you paint in class, you can get this um, free. So it's an exceptional opportunity that I'm offering you there. It's worth going to the trouble of figuring out how to get to Water Brush Teacher on Facebook, or it's worth the trouble of taking a photograph of what you paint with me in class and sending it to me as an email, in an email. You can just reply to one of those um, emails and then your, um, and do the photograph that you've taken as an attachment. And like I said, you get extra points with me if you do a selfie, if you don't mind your, your face showing, or if uh, you get somebody else to hold the, the camera so that you can hold up your picture. And um, I don't know if y'all can see me in your gallery view, but if you can, this is kind of what we, we do at the end of the class is just hold the picture up and I'll show you again at the end of the class. Also, I wanna remind you, you, you know, basically we're trying to stay muted. If you have any comments at all, any questions, if you just, um, you know, want to make known that you're here and um, um, have any reason, I would love for you to unmute yourself and say whatever you want to say. And, you know, questions are definitely um, encouraged. Um, there are no dumb questions in my class. Um, no matter how many times I repeat it, um, people continue to say to me, what do you mean by a brushstroke? And they continue to ask, why is the water brush better? They continue to ask. And it's, it's, you know, we can say things to each other so many different ways and it's not heard until it's understood. And so I encourage you to please don't be afraid to ask. And I, I'm happy to tell you. Um, so this painting, this particular one, um, is the only one I've ever taken into a pattern intentionally, Zelda and Frida, because you all have painted more longhorns on, in blue bonnets with me than just this one. But this is the only one that we do on a regular basis. And um, because I am most famous for my Texas longhorns, and so most of them are not available as a pattern. I mean, I would say the rest of them are not available as a pattern. I do have a few other Longhorns that are available, but the iconic Texas Longhorn in the Blue Bonnets is not. And so this is a real special thing to get to paint with you all. And I really, really appreciate that. And I wanna show you, this is basically the way we're gonna paint it. He's going to be the iconic orange and white Texas Longhorn um, with the dark ends on his horns and uh, standing in a field of blue bonnets. And it's just a fun, fun painting to do. So um, then I also want to tell you just a little bit about the water brush. 
in case anybody just opened their water brush, um, you, you needed to know this before this. First of all, the water brush comes with sizing on, on the tip of the brush. And so when you take it out of the package, it looks like this. You need to pull the cap off. It doesn't unscrew, it pulls off. And your tip is gonna be white if it's brand new or clear looking. Anyway, they're synthetic um, um, bristles. But what you wanna do is run this under running water because you wanna get that sizing off because a little bit of that sizing just gets in there and it's kind of oily and it'll ruin your first painting if you have not washed your brush. And so you want to do that. You wanna run water over that. And then you can put the cap here, but if you're gonna get ready to paint with it, um, I recommend that you um, put it on the back of the, of the paintbrush. So put it right there, click, it kind of clicks on and will hold on there. And that way you don't lose it because you wanna be able to put that cap back on that brush to be able to keep that, that, those bristles good. So the next thing you need to do is you need to unscrew, and this is unscrew, this isn't pull off. So you're unscrewing the, the bristles and you're gonna fill it with tap water. Just fill it with regular water. If you fill it with some special water or anything, it's not gonna make a bit of difference because, because what wears out on this brush is the tip of the brush. It's not the water causing problems. And so then, but it lasts you a very, very long time. It's not a quick wear out, but it's always nice to be able to get that new tip. And I like to have more than one brush going because when you first open this brush, when you first get ready to use it, the water seems to run a little bit faster than it does as time goes on. So now then my, I have water in my brush, tap water in my brush, my bristles are clean and then right there in the sink, or if you're not at the sink, if you've forgotten, you want to come over and squeeze your brush until it's dripping. Can you all see that that is dripping? So that cleans out any sizing that might have gotten inside of the filter. Now you'll never have to squeeze it again unless you're cleaning your brush. So the when you're painting, you are not squeezing this brush. The other thing is, is if you screw this on so tight that there's not the airflow that there's supposed to be, sometimes you don't have any water flow at all. So you want to just make sure that it's just thumb tight and that you can squeeze water through it. So that's how the water brush has to be prepared. Now then, how does the water brush work? The water brush is gravity flow. This filter is absolutely wonderful. It keeps the water from just dumping out because this, these bristles will never get any wetter than this, the bristles can hold. Now, when you put your brush on your side, like you do when I teach you to do a brush stroke, that opens the waterways a little bit. So your brush does become wetter and wetter. So you have to learn how much color, how much water you have to the water brush. But the water brush starts out being pretty consistent. And so you learn how to paint in watercolor quicker than you would otherwise. So now then, what we wanna to do to load our brush, and I am going to switch out palettes here. I wanted you all to see all of the wonderful um, palettes or colors that you get if you get into one of my studio classes. I need a palette that's not, that's been used. I mean, it has been used. So here is a palette that looks just like I would send you if when you, when you win or if you purchase the beginner's palette. There's nothing beginner about this, but there is all you need to begin. 
So that would be the way I would describe. Now we call this the professional palette, but you certainly don't want to be a wait until you're a professional to use quality paint. And I have done I have done podcasts on why that's true. So we won't go into that any farther. Um, there's a lot of information available out there about why it is um, just right. So the first thing I want to do, you see this little bit of blue back here and this little bit of blue on his, on his leg. Now there's no reason why you wouldn't do it, but there's some people that are just, I'm not gonna put blue on my longhorn, but blue to the eye kind of says reflection or it says white, Watercolor painters use blue a lot to communicate both of those things, either reflection off of the sky or reflection off of these blue bonnets, or they say this is white. So on most of my longhorns, I have just a little bit of blue that shows up and um, I don't have a lot of places I can put the image that you, you all can see, but I can get it a little bit so that it's visual. So first color we're gonna do is that blue. And I want you to rub the brush against the hard dry color. So I've rubbed the brush quite a bit. I've put quite a bit of water into that color. See, this is the way the action looks like this. And then I want to take that color and I want to put it over into the palette tray. So now then I've got blue paint on my brush. I've got blue paint on the palette tray. My brush is too wet. I want to wipe my brush off. I didn't clean it really. I just wiped it off. And I want to come back in here to this very, very light color blue. And I want to put that blue just kind of right in this area. And other than just putting it down and leaving it alone, I mean, I know I brushed it twice. I didn't need to do that. I could have just done it once. And then I'm going to come back here on this back leg and I put it on the back leg. So then I'm going to clean my brush, which means I wipe it on a paper towel. And if it still needs to be sure that it's clean, I do a little tiny bit of a squeeze there. And I think I have, um, see, I might add right now that if, um, you are watching me today and you don't have everything you need to paint this. And on Wednesday, you get the email that has the video from the class. If you want to paint off of the video, download the pattern and paint off of the video, you're welcome to do that. And you're welcome to enter that painting into the hat. To, re to win the um, basic palette. So any way that you paint one of the paintings with me, whether it's during class or during the video, either one is fine. So I'm a stickler on cleaning my palette, but we're gonna use this blue again real soon and you'll see how we're gonna use it in a little bit. Not yet though. Um, and so the next color I want to paint is the orange. So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna get what's called permanent orange. And if you've got the prying watercolor, you have orange. If you have the primary colors and the secondary colors, you have orange. Because orange is a secondary color and it's also the complement to purple. So a lot, of a lot of palettes have the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue in the secondary colors, purple, green, and orange. And so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean my brush again because it has a lot of water on it. I wanna come over here into my palette tray. So I got my orange, put it on the cap palette tray. I wiped my brush so that it wasn't too much, too wet. 
Now I come back in here and I get this paint, which is a wash of orange. And I'm going to just come in here in his face and I don't have much paint on my, my brush. I can tell because I don't have much color when I put it down on the, the Longhorn. But I'm gonna paint that fat, his face. And I am leaving his eyes kind of wet. I mean, I'm sorry, kind of white. And so this one, I'm gonna come over here and do it just a little bit more on top of that. And when I do that, it probably picked up some color, but it probably left a little too. So now I'm gonna put the brush down right up here because that's where we're gonna have a little tuft of hair. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna paint my spots. Now, one of the things on painting your spots is you can come right into your color. You don't have to pick the color up that's on the tray. And you just do a little stat, a little spot like that, and it will be darker. And if you're finding that your brush is very wet, stop what you're doing right there and wipe that brush with your paper towel and then go back to painting. Also, I'm going to go back in and come to, to the side of his face, and I don't mind it having quite a bit of color on it. And I'm going to fill in this spot of um, orange right there that says he has a lot of orange on his front. So I need to cough. So I'm going to take my ear, AirPods out, and y'all won't be able to hear me. So just a moment. So can you hear me again? Okay, good. good. So we have more orange to paint and I'm gonna go ahead and get started with it again. So right here, I have uh, the front leg is orange and this right leg is orange. Our front right leg and then right down on his back legs, just at the very tip of it, it is orange. And I'm gonna clean my brush so I don't leave paint sitting in my brush. And I'm gonna pick this up so that y'all can see what all paint. And Barbara, I'm watching your face. So when you get finished, um, I want you to just look at me until I notice and I'll tell you. <laughs> so are you, you're not finished, are you? You are finished? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so don't go messing in your painting, you all. When you go back into your painting, all you do is make it more moist, more wet. You're just gonna be waiting that much longer for that color to dry. Because really, really dark colors aren't gonna show on top of wet paint. And we're gonna to need to do some dark colors later on. There's a lot of reasons. It's just not watercolor painting when you go back into that brush stroke all the time. You want to make the brush stroke, pick up your brush and leave it alone. And so if I see your face down, I'm assuming that you're probably still painting. And if you look at me, then I know that you're not messing in your painting and you are ready to go on to the next step. And Barbara, I don't mean to call you out. <laughs> I, I hope that didn't bother you that I did that. So, cause um, um, really enjoy seeing your smiling face, looking down or looking up either one. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make the ends of his horns the darker brown. So I'm going to take this, this color down here, which is just a brown, but it's called quinacridone burnt orange in Daniel's, with Daniel Smith. And I'm going to come up here and I'm going to mix it a little bit with that blue. I don't want to mix it too much because I don't want a lot of water in it. 
But do you all see that it's kind of a dark brown? It got darker. We mixed it with the blue and it got darker. If you all don't want to mix the color or if you've already cleaned your palette, don't worry about a thing, just use your brown. Don't, don't worry about whether it's mixed or not. But I want everybody to watch me now as I pick that color up. So there's the color. I just picked up a little tiny bit on my brush. And all I'm gonna do is just lay that brush down on top of that horn. And I'm gonna come over here and do the same thing. Now I made, made sure that my brush had a tip too before I did that. But you all can see that that's all I did with that was just lay that color down. And this is, you know, the first time I think that I've had y'all mix any color if you've been painting with me. And if this is your first time, that's a little bit bigger step than, than we usually use on Saturday mornings or free. But there's no reason why you shouldn't try it. And also, like I said, if you just want to use your brown right out of the palette, you can do that too. And now there's another place that I want you to do that. And I'm gonna come back over here again and I'm gonna put it just on this side of his face. And that's all I'm gonna do there. And then again, I'm gonna do it right down here and I'm gonna kind of go outside of that drawing space and I'm gonna put it right there. And if you're on a roll and you've got a good dark brown, I'm gonna load my brush with just a little bit more. We can come in here and do their ho his hooves. Now, the hooves on a longhorn are split. So I like to make it look, have two, um, whoops, yeah, that's fine though. The bottom of his leg and then do two, because I like to kind of exaggerate the things on the longhorn that we're trying to um, show. So now then I'm gonna clean my brush. Oh, I have one more place I want dark brown and that is his ears. And you can always turn your painting to um, make sure that you keep your hand, the side of your hand out of the paint. And I have another place I wanna do the darker brown and that's right across his nose. And it's just a little bit, you don't have to fill it in. We are not using a crayon, we're using a paintbrush. And so we are not going back and forth. We're just laying that brush down and picking it up. Okay, so Pat, you've helped me with the chat a little bit this morning. Thank you. Um, um, I've been, we've been asked. Um, so Linda, uh, welcome, Linda Roan, welcome to, I guess I shouldn't have said your last name. I apologize if you don't want everybody to know, but it, since it's in the chat, I guess you really don't know. From Powhatan, Virginia, you're gonna have to pronounce that for me later. So, because I'm certain I didn't do it correctly. Um, so, and wow, Pat, thank you. Um, um, yes, so thank you. Um, so June, um, um, thank you for all your comments about transferring the image. And 
Um, then we, Linda asked what kind of paint we are using. Yes, we are using Daniel Smith watercolor paint. And I'm gonna do a little commercial break here um, on that uh, subject for anybody that's whether you're finished or not. So I am a uh, ambassador for Daniel Smith paint. And what that means is they actually advertise me as a teacher all over the world because they have a three foot by um, six foot banner that they hang at the back of their booth when they're doing conferences. And it has my palette on it, my professional palette, which is this what's on this dot card. And it has all about me and it has pictures of me and it has pictures of some of the paintings that I teach with. So um, I try to be very, true to Daniel Smith and represent them on every opportunity I can. And you all have a lot of these colors if you have my beginner palette or my um, professional palette or the studio palette as well. So it's um, all that all that's in this palette is Daniel Smith colors. And anytime you're wanting to know the specific color that I'm using, if I don't mention it, um, I'm happy to tell you. Um, and if you're using um, the, the watercolor pencils, I would love to see how it goes. And um, I've done accents with watercolor pencils and um, you know, I use them to use, if I'm gonna splatter, co um, splatter color around a painting, I use them. But other than that, I'm not experienced with them at all. So um, thank you for all of your chat um, questions and, and everything. So now then we're gonna move on and I wanna make my orange on his face just a little bit brighter. So I'm gonna clean my palette now, which I am a real stickler for keeping a clean palette because if you're not, if you're not careful and you don't keep a clean palette, most often that is the way you end up getting muddy color. So I really, Daniel Smith is, um, the colors that I've chosen are all transparent colors, all of them except this one, which is Serpentine Genuine. And it's not the, you know, it's a little bit op opaque, but I really like to teach you about the variety of colors. And um, if you've got a dirty palette and you're over here putting the color down, you can't help but pick up some other colors. And that is not very helpful. So now then what we wanna do to go a little bit brighter on his face on this orange is put this brush over here, put it down over here and then immediately come in here and do another layer. And if the color that you're laying it down on top of is dry, that's going to take a lot of color. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here on uh, um, his chest and side there. So, and we don't need to go back into the leg if you don't want to, but um, if, you know, and you don't even have to be real steady about it. Now I'm going to clean my brush. I'm gonna clean my palette again. And we are getting so close to the end of everything with this painting. Um, you know, now we get to the place that we do quite a bit of work. So um, on this one, I have gone in and darkened his entire horn. If you want to do that, I recommend that you come over here and get your brown, put it in the palette, and um, make sure it's a good wash. And then I would go the other direction on my um, horn rather than um, try to go back into that point that way. So then I'm gonna turn the painting around again, put the brush down into the horn and just pull it out. So there we go. Okay, so thank you, Linda, for the 
that I still would like to hear you say it, but I guess we're not going to um, necessarily um, get to, but maybe you'll join me over and over again. And we all, so um, I grew up in Oklahoma, moved to Texas in 2004. And in Oklahoma, most of the towns are Indian names. Um, and like we have a Pawhuska. Um, and um, maybe the H is silent like that. Um, so now then, um, as soon as Pat is finished, um, so you're finished, okay. So now then we are going to do our blue, um, blue bonnets, our blue bonnets. So um, if you only have one blue, um, I recommend that you do it, do one that has um, a little bit of a variation in how dark it is when you put it down. One of the, our colors is phthalo blue red shade and it is a dark blue constantly. You ha really have to work at having it be a wash. Now the uh, manganese blue, this one right here, is a very light color at best. And so I'm going to use the manganese blue hue and come over here and put it on my palette. But really what I'm doing is moistening the paint again so that it will um, be moist enough for me to be able to paint right in that um, paint. Now I really want you to watch me put my brush down on for the blue bonnets because as you can see we're going to fill in all of this area but do you see all this white space in between the dots on where I put it down? We want a lot of white space. In fact, it's usually more white space than you would expect. And, um, and Pat, I definitely don't want to encourage you from answering the, uh, any of the chat because I think I'm going to quit until the end of the class on, on reading the chats um, since you're here helping me. So here I go into the blue, right straight into the blue. My brush was already wet and the blue was already wet. And I'm just gonna put that brush down and I am not really laying the brush down. Okay, so do you remember what, if I was like doing his horn, I'd lay the brush down and pull it out. Or if I was filling in an area, I would lay the brush down and I would pull it out. This, we are just using kind of the tip of the brush and Blue bonnets kind of stand up tall, but you don't want a whole bunch of repetition in your pattern. You want to move around to put your brush down. Now, when you get to the bottom of this, I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do when we come back just mainly so that you don't overdo the blue down here. I don't want you to stop doing your blue to do this. So I'm gonna just talk about it. I'm not gonna paint it. But when we get finished with the blue, we're gonna come get the green and we're gonna do grass strokes. You see the grass that's down here at the bottom? And so you don't have to cover all the way down to the very bottom of your blue bonnets to to, um, um, because we're gonna be painting the grass on there. So I'm gonna, if I, if I painted it on here, you'd think that's what you were supposed to stop and do, but we're not gonna do that yet. So I'm gonna come into the blue and get these, um, load my brush. And, you know, as you put this down, you lose quite a bit of, um, I mean, the, the paint, you're using the paint, not, not quite a bit, but you're losing paint as you put it down. So you might have to come back in and get more paint every once in a while. And you always wanna make sure that your brush is not too wet.
Okay. And I'm going to lift that up for you to be able to see it. So um, I did go in and look at the at the chat, and uh, Pat is correct when I send you the pallet I do, but I will share that information in your Wednesday email. So the Wednesday email is when you can count on um, seeing the video from today. It's when you will see. Uh, what image we're painting next week. I mean, I'm most likely will tell you too today, but I'll have the image in there. And then I also have the pattern and I also have the Zoom link. So in case you don't have a chance to look at any of the other videos, I mean, any of the other emails rest of the week, you have everything available to you from that Wednesday. The email I send out to you on Friday and the email I send out to you on Saturday morning are both reminders and just another opportunity to know about it. I mean, as our week goes on, we have a better ability to know what we can and can't do on the weekends. So um, I want to always be able to provide you with that. And um, Please, if you get tired of me, you can unsubscribe from those emails um, and you'll just stop getting it. Some of you might be signed up for two, on two different lists. Um, some of you are teachers that have come to me on that list and some of you, and I try to make sure that everybody's just on one list, but I do send out specific or quilt block art, um, people that are interested in quilt block, in my quilt blocks sometimes. And so you, if you're on that list, you could be getting more than one email. And um, so anytime that you notice for sure, oh, I'm getting this two times, um, um, it, you, there's a place that you can look to see if you're getting it, um, um, I'm really not sure about that part, but you can unsubscribe to one of them. So, or even send me an email and tell me to unsubscribe you. I'll always take care of, of all these things are just way too confusing for us these days. So um, now then I am going to um, assume that, um, we are about ready to, we're, we've done our blue bonnets now. So, um, uh, but I'll just do a picture of the palette and a color chart that I have created with that in the email on Wednesday. So now then I'm gonna do the grass and I'm gonna do the grass with my fine point brush. Now I don't provide students with this brush but if you buy the kit, the package that has four different brushes in it, you're gonna get a large, which is something that you'll wanna use if you ever paint la uh, landscapes. You will get a medium, you'll get a, a small, which is this one, and you'll get a flat. Now, I have never really become very uh, accustomed to using the flat, but you'll use those other three with me at one time or another. And grass is a lot of fun to do with this small brush. And you'll find that you like it so much that you'll use it when you really should be using the medium sometimes. Um, so the only thing is, is if you use the small all the time, you wear it out real fast. So other than that, I don't know a lot of reasons why that's, really gets in the way if you really like using it best. So I just come in here and I put in 
these brush strokes and they can kind of they they don't they can be fat they can be skinny they can be anything um, that you make because we're going to come back in with the black lines and um, create um, what the eye will see more they'll see the the eye will see color but um, the black lines will create uh, really and truly the look that um, you want with this grass. So I'm going um, up and down, I'm picking it up and doing another brush stroke every once in a while. And then I'm also going to get this green on my brush and I'm going to come up here in a few places and I am going to um, just put the brush down and let a little bit of grass be in my blue bonnets. Not very much. We don't want to give up much of that white space. So now then I'm going to clean my brush, lay it down. I'm going to pick up the painting so that you all can really come in and see what I've done. Kathleen, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was trying to fill my little brush with water, so I wasn't watching. Did you use your medium brush for the grass within the blue bonnets and the small one at the bottom, or did you use the small one all over? Thank you. For years, I have felt like students really needed to paint with my specific palette to really learn fast and because I think learning how the colors act is as important as which color you use and since I'm so familiar with Daniel Smith paint I'm able to really teach you a lot about that paint but when I just found out absolutely how much I love teaching on Zoom. And I want the class to grow and I, I want the class to be able to learn at that same pace. I decided that lots of people have wonderful watercolor paint at home that they don't want to just have more paint. They want to use and learn their colors. And if that's what you want to do, I will definitely work with that. I just don't really know a lot of the other brands. I'm a little bit familiar with Holbein and I'm a little bit familiar with Lucas. Outside of that, and then of course the Prang kit that I suggest everybody buy for $8 or buy the Prang kit off of my Etsy store. That's the other one that I'm real familiar with that. I've actually painted with that Prang color since I was 12 years old. So, and it's the very same paint as they had when I was 12 years old. But that said, I just want you all to know, I'm really, really happy if you are using any paint. Um, one time somebody asked my husband, which was the best Bible. And um, though he has specific ones he likes, he said to them, the Bible that you will read. And I feel the same way about watercolor paint. What's the best watercolor paint? It's the watercolor paint that you will use. So um, that is how I feel about that. Um, uh, and I just think it's wonderful that we are um, painting together. That's even better um, with all of the social distancing and everything that we do so important that we look into each other's eyes and I have found out that we can do that even on Zoom. So now then there are other things that we could do um, to our Longhorn um, with paint. Uh, like for instance we can go in and color his eyes black. Um, a lot of times I find out that that's problematic um, but maybe you don't have a black pen that's going to work really well. So I want to show you what I'm talking about. 
but all you need to do is load your brush, the tip of your brush with a lot of black or dark color. And then you just want to put it down right there in that eye. Just put it down in that eye. You don't need to do any more than that because that is going to read as his eye on this little painting. It just uh, doesn't require a lot of detail to make that impression. So I'm going to clean my brush and clean my palette. And then I'm going to put my palette aside. Because the next thing we're going to do is make this painting just super wonderful, fancy with my um, the way I teach you to do the sketching of the black lines. And I always try to get that. I need a new backboard, don't I? <clears throat> so one of the things that um, I recommend that you do, and um, well, OK, so let's talk about black pens for just a little bit. Um, ultra fine retractable Sharpie, or if it's got a cap, are both the same thing. The size is the ultra fine. And it's a very, very small tip on that ultra fine marker. My favorite pen and the one that I use the most, have used for the most years, is this Prismacolor <coughs> Premier 0.03. And it is a very small point, but they're both about the same size. So I'd be willing to say that the Sharpie is a 0.03. The other one that is real, I want to talk about is this wonderful, wonderful Finito pen that Pentel makes. And it's extra fine in its porous point pen. It is again about a 0.03. Now the difference between these two pens and this one is these two are water fast they do not react to water. They're going to stay right there on the page just the way you put them if they get wet. This one, if it gets wet, it bleeds. It just will pick it up and it will bleed and it will ruin your painting very quickly. So I love to use this one on, the, on a finished painting, but I don't recommend that you do it until you're very experienced with this stage because you don't want a little tiny wet spot on your painting to run and ruin your painting. And I love the ultra fine Sharpie because it doesn't break easily. And watercolor paper has a little bit of tooth. Even the hot press has a little bit of tooth. And so <clears throat> if you push down very far hard, it's easy to break the point on this pen. And you'll ruin this pen by pushing down too hard. But on the Sharpie, they seem to last a very long time for students. And so that's why I took up using it was because I didn't have a lot of points broken when I was teaching face to face. But also my students wanted to purchase them and it was easy for them to find them and um, replace their their markers. So <clears throat> like I said, this stage is actually a sketch. It is not an outline. Now when it's an animal, it's going to seem more like an outline because it has, um, um, you have lines drawn already. But for instance, like this little tuft of hair down here, that goes on the inside of the drawing that you've transferred. This little area right there that I've just done a little jagged line, that was just kind of my own expression, my way of doing it. The Longhorn doesn't really need a brown tail or a black tail, but if you want to go in there and put a little tufted bit of hair, then it, you're fine to do it with the black marker. But this way you give it the option. Plus, what about the eyelashes on a Longhorn? They really do have eyelashes. And so it's kind of fun to draw that on there. So that's why I tell you it's a sketch. 
it is not an outline is because you can do a little bit of your own self-expression. The other thing I want to tell you is I have a bit of a trimmer and I've had this trimmer for many years and y'all have, if you've been with me on Saturdays or free, you're going to hear this every week because everybody hasn't been with me every week and you need to know it. I have learned how to hold my hand over my wrist, put my elbows against my side, and I have learned to sketch pretty loosely from my hand. I was taught when I was taught to draw that drawing comes from the eyes to the tip of your fingers. And so you do not put your hand down on the paper that you're sketching on. I sometimes have to do that. And again, I've learned that I can put my hand here, my elbows against my side, and I can have a lot of co control of sketching. The other thing I want to say is it's always, always wise to practice this a little bit before you go on to your painting. And so if you are like me and have any problem with any trimmer, I recommend that you do that. Hand on your wrist elbows against your side, and then just practice with this. Go short, go straight, go jiggly, go whatever you want to. Also, anytime you do a long line, that's not as pretty as doing broken lines. And on a painting, I can guarantee you, you're gonna be a lot happier with broken lines than you would be doing a straight line unless you get a, a ruler out. So practice doing circles, feel the paper against the tip, know what it's like, do these little scriggly things just to practice. This is the stage that I think all of Texas started calling my art whimsical is from these lines. The other thing at this stage, I can frequently just put a finger on my hand and, and steady it. But usually with um, the final thing on an animal, I really have to work at it very, very cautiously. So I'm going to come in here and do his eyes first. And whoops, that was quite a long eyelash there that I just did. But wait, he's going to be rather funny looking from that, but that's okay. I'm not. Um, I'm try not trying to make him perfect. I'm going to come up here and do his little hair, um, which isn't unusual for the Longhorn to have that um, that look on his um, um, the top of his head. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do a little more, bit more attention to the eyes so that um, he. Um, I bring more attention to those eyes. Now then, here we go with the broken line and um, just not doing, and that's what I'm gonna do on his horn. And, um, Also, if you were sitting there going, oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have done that, I wish it didn't, I didn't do that, I want you to take this painting and I want you to look at it held out at the end of your arm. I don't know, here, I'll get in the picture if you can see me. So art is supposed to be viewed three to six feet away. So if you'll view that at the end of your arm, that is the way people are going to see that painting. Plus, they are not going to see all the detail that you're drawing into the painting when you are the distance you're from it, when you're painting it and when you're drawing it. So don't worry about people noticing anything that you might think is a, a mistake. 
because they don't look at art that that close. And if they do walk up to it and really look at it, I promise you they're a painter looking at that art. It's not the viewer of art that, the, it's not the art appreciator that gets up close and notices everything about your painting. It's somebody that has done painting themselves and they are trying to learn more about how you did it. And they um, surely won't be to criti critique either. Um, and if they do criticize it, I recommend that you just don't show your art to that person again. So it's uh, not one of those things that you don't get better with criticism in my classes. You get better with confidence. So on my Longhorn, on this one, I did not go in and draw circles around his spots. You can if you want to. Now then for the blue bonnets. Um, and if you anybody isn't ready for the blue bonnets, I recommend that you stop what you're doing for just a minute and watch me. So every one of these blue dots does not need a circle. You can just come in here and do your lines, your circles, anywhere that you want to. And um, down here at the bottom, we're going to be taking our brick pen and just doing this kind of action. So, and they can be on top of each other. It's still what the eye is going to see is going to be the same. So, um, and blue bonnets kind of have a top and then they sort of go down in thirds or in twos, but you don't have to draw your blue bonnets that way. They can just be going down, going to the side, little, little squiggly line circles. And um, going between his legs, you know, I'm being a little bit careful um, with it, but um, I'm really just trying to get the eye to kind of read them as blue bonnets, which they're going to, they're blue. So I'll be quiet and finish the stage and then hold it up for you all to see. And then I'm going to go ahead and, well, no, I'm going to wait to sign the painting so I can teach you all about where to sign your paintings.
So I've taken this class past an hour. It's 1020 now. And I really appreciate you all staying with me because I want, I would love for the classes to, um, to, you know, for us to be able to be finished, um, you know, within that hour. But the Longhorn does have a lot more uh, to him. So I'm not going to be too hard on myself about that. Um, the, um, 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 okay, there we go. Um, so, Pat, you're finished with that stage, but I better not count on that. Barbara, are you finished with that? You are? Okay. So I am going to go to the next thing of signing our painting. And then shortly after that, we will stop and share um, the gallery view. So I'm going to put this on top of this just so that you all can, um, you know, really it'll stand out like that. Now then, I'm going to take this little white mat that I use every week to show you all and teach you all about um, watercolor paintings and frames and signatures. So over the years of my career, which spans 50 plus, um, you know, a lot of those, the majority of them uh, are literally as a professional artist because I started selling oil paintings when I was in my twenties. Um, the, um, um, industry said watercolor paintings had to, had to be framed very quickly and they needed to be matted to keep the painting away from the glass. And the reason for that was that moisture could come through the walls and get the back of a painting moist and then it went in and got the paper moist and then the painting bled plus it stuck to the glass when it dried. Well we have good insulation in our homes now and we have wonderful frames that put the glass right up next to the painting. So I'm here to tell you that that is fine. It's no problem if you buy one of those front loader frames that the painting goes right up next to the glass um, and that is fine. But the place to, to sign your paintings is still inside of the art. So if you put a mat on top of this art, you're gonna have this space down below to sign your name. And so my name is gonna go right down here in this space that I've got available between the art and my um, mat, in the mat on the on the art. You all can tell I don't always keep my mind straight when I'm doing two things at once, talking and painting or writing. So that is where it goes. And now then, if I was gonna pop that into a little frame um, and mat it, it would just fit right perfect. And um, since we're doing this Longhorn, I think I'm gonna teach you all about um, a frame that 